Okay, I can I can walk us through this slide here really quick. Um, welcome everybody. We're excited to have you here virtually or in person in the in the room in the library. Just a couple of quick tips, especially for those who are joining virtually with us today. Um, to improve your audio clarity, we would recommend using headphones or maybe swapping to your phone audio just to make sure you have that best quality for the audio today. Um, your microphone, if you are on uh, virtually with us on Zoom, it is going to be automatically on mute just to minimize that background noise as we go through today. Um, so if you do have any questions during the Q&A, um, you will have an opportunity to speak up and ask those questions. You can go ahead and put them directly into the Q&A chat box um, in Zoom, and we can go ahead and get that question answered for you. Um, so there's that Zoom chat feature here. So I think with that, that should cover everything for our technology, unless uh, anyone has a question. But with that, I'll go ahead and pass it over to um, Patrick. Okay, well, thank you, Sarah. Our agenda here is today, and we're going to start with our um, city staff and to the, uh, if our East Hill City Council members are there in the room. So let me turn it over to Karen and to Jeff. Go ahead, Jeff. Is this mic working? Can you hear me if I stand here? We're good. This mic's still going to hear me okay? Great. Thank you, Patrick. Um, fortunately, Council Member Scipio will not make it this evening, so I'll give uh, just some remarks from, uh, from the city side. So, um, Patrick, do we just... Uh, are you advancing the slides or who, who is going to do that? Sarah's advancing them. So uh, you can just ask her and she'll move them forward. Slide, will that work? Yeah. Great, go ahead. We'll go over to the next few slides. One more. Great. So why are we here? And if I walk around, I'm just trying to move this to a little bit. Um, thank you all for coming here. Yeah, let me do that. I'll, I'll, I'll do this part of the So as you see here, you know, we're here tonight to, to just kind of give you guys the first snapshot of what's recommended uh, for our transit system moving forward. Um, obviously, we're here to put this in front of you so we can be transparent with what's going on and get your feedback so we know how it's affecting you. So you're going to see that. We're going to ask at the end of the meeting that you document those concerns. We can take those away. Comment cards are here. We want to make sure that we're here for you and that your voice is heard. So, Council Member uh, Mississippi is not here to say those same things, but I want to make sure that I can say that before you leave, if you have a comment, if it's not heard, please see me directly. Okay? Let's talk a little bit about why we're here. So, some of the recommended short term system, ch system changes, which is why we're here tonight, to kind of introduce those to you. This is an introduction to some of the things that we are recommending. Based, basically to address some of the, the current needs that we're having with our transit system and try to move us to where we could be a sustainable system moving forward. And obviously this is a two-part study. We have the short-term system that we're talking about tonight. And then of course, this is a part of the longer term system changes that is ongoing and will carry us through this calendar year. So understand this is a, what we're calling identified here as a quick win scenario. Um, but again, it is part of a longer term system recommendations. And every, everything that we're, you're going to hear tonight as part of these recommended changes uh, are, are, are meant to be a piece of the long, longer study and can be implemented in addition to that, that bigger term, long term plan. And another goal here is indicated provide consistent and reliable service improvements based on current available bus operators and staffing shortages. And I'll go into a little bit more detail here in just a moment about why we're doing those things and making the room and you folks aware of why we're recommending these based on what we're seeing is our availability to provide that with our current staffing uh, availability. And of course, identify areas where WISTA funding can serve the most people. Slide, please. So I wanted to call your attention to kind of what we're seeing, not just uh, around WISTA, but nationwide, right? This is not just uh, a WISTA problem, but notice the article that we, we call out here from Raleigh as reported yesterday and some of the challenges that they're seeing also in some of our other, other major transit providers in the state, identifying the same kind of operator and driver shortages. And WISTA is no different. And I have to, I'll publicly say this, and our general manager is here in the room, we are doing our best to hire drivers. We're doing our best to find <laughs> operators and, and move our, our transit system forward. But as indicated in Raleigh, as indicated by partners across the country, uh, bus operators and bus drivers aren't bountiful. And those challenges are, are many. And so we want to be able to provide those services as frequently as we can, but understand there's limitations with our labor resources. And that's why we're here tonight to address those 
but then also provide a service that we can where we have the most ridership addressing the needs that we can with the available resources that we do have. Slide, please. In recent years, WIS has had to reduce evening services. And so if you're a frequent uh, Worcester rider, you're probably aware of some of the recent changes. Obviously, we dealt with several challenges through the COVID-19 pandemic and some of those evening challenges and some of those uh, uh, operational changes that have been made in the past few years. And the bus operator shortages, well, we're still there. But we didn't really come out of that the way we thought or had hoped. And we're still dealing with some of those operator shortages today. So WISTA does not have enough bus operators to excuse me, to recommend the return of evening services at this time. And again, as I mentioned, this is an issue of capacity. There's not enough available drivers to facilitate the routes in the capacity that is currently advertised. And so what we're trying to do is address those with these quick win scenarios moving forward as we progress. And what's the plans to bring back the evening services when enough bus operators are available to support the additional bus hours? So as I mentioned, and Ms. Donna's here, we are trying to bridge that gap, but again, that takes time and that takes folks that are willing to go through our process and be quality service providers for our citizens. And that's the challenges that we're dealing with. And, and, and we'll continue to tackle that as we can, but just want to be transparent and clear. That's the hurdles we're trying to address uh, based on our, our labor resources. Next slide, please. So some of the changes that you'll hear uh, tonight, and, I, and again, and Mr. Patrick will go into a lot more detail. So I'll stay in my lane and, and just introduce these, and then we'll go into some more detail that he will share uh, from these. But some of the things you'll notice tonight, we'll, we'll recommend some route changes. So you'll, hit, you'll have a lot more details. I'll also uh, make note there's literature tonight with maps that show these changes and recommendations. So be sure you're leaving tonight with all the literature that we have and to document what we're, what we're going to be showing on the screen. And you can carry that with you. Of course, a new day pass, uh, talking about that single day pass where, you know, right now, if you enter the bus, it's one ride, it's one pass, and it's recommending a day pass where basically you're purchasing that, that pass for that calendar day. And then the rides that you get as many times you got off that bus was service for that day. And we'll be giving give you some more details about that momentarily. And then trying to streamline some of our processes, how you purchase your tickets with a new ticket machine at the transportation center and making those facilities a little bit more user friendly, a little more accessible and a little bit more um, efficient to get our systems and our users out to go a little bit better. So those are some of the main things that you'll see tonight. And as I turn it over, I think back to Patrick, you're going to see, we're going to go into a little bit more detail on these, but I will say one more time, don't forget the literature that is here. Please be sure to get that. And let me be clear. As a transportation director for the city of Winston-Salem, tonight's purpose is to get your feedback, understand what the challenges are, where we're falling short, and document that accordingly so that we can take that back to our city managers and our elected officials and make some educated decisions based on real documented feedback. So if you know anything tonight, know that this meeting is for you and that we're trying to make this system as efficient as we can with the challenges that are very real. Okay, so help us help you. And Patrick, I think that's all the slides that I was supposed to go over. Is that correct? Is yes, sir. I'm going to turn it back over to you. Okay, well, thank you very much, Jeff. And, um, I want to thank everybody for being here today, both uh, in the room there at the Forsyth County Library and mm -hmm. online. It looks like we have um, several participants who are listening in as well. Um, my job here, I am a consultant with HDR. We are supporting the city of Winston-Salem uh, in delivering the WISTA bus route study. And so that includes uh, analyzing route performance. It includes talking to operators. And we did a survey of bus operators at WISTA to hear how they thought the system could be improved. And some of the ideas that they brought forward are part of the changes that we're sharing this evening. Um, I work with Matt Duchan, who's there in the room, who's the project manager on the city side, uh, with Donna Woodson, who's our, our leader at WISTA. And this has been a, a group of recommendations that have come through uh, the consideration of many people who are close to the system. But the reason why we're here tonight, as Jeff said, is that we also need to hear from people who use the system every day. We, hear, we need to hear from people who would like to use the system if it could be changed in a way that might make it more useful for them. Um, and as Jeff said, this, this is an opportunity for you to tell us uh, what you think about these changes um, because we have an opportunity to adjust these changes before they go to the city council. I think that's the most important thing here tonight. Um, there is a possibility that something you see, see here tonight might change because of something you might tell us. And that's why your, your input is so important. So with that, I'm going to go through what the, the current proposal is, and then at the end, we'll do uh, questions and answers and have some discussion. So um, right now, I want to start off by highlighting, highlighting the key route changes that are being proposed in this uh, sort of quick wins package of service adjustments. Um, there are three routes. Um, 
routes 83, 93, and 103, which now come every 60 minutes, which will go to um, having service every 30 minutes. So instead of picking up passengers once per hour, it'll pick them up twice per hour. This gives people more choices and departure times and where they want to go throughout the day. Um, one of the other things that's going on that's helping create the hours to add those frequencies is that we went through at the beginning of the study and looked at the routes that are carrying the most passengers and the, the routes that are carrying the fewest. And one of the questions that every transit agency that is providing you know, mass public transportation asks itself is, what can we do with the limited dollars we have to carry the most people possible? And so part of what we're recommending here this evening is that four routes, routes 99, 100, 108 and 110 would be eliminated so that those hours could be moved to um, routes 83, 93 and 103. And really why these routes? And the answer is, is pretty simple. When you look at routes 99, 100, 108 and 110, roughly 2% of all the people on Worcester ride those four routes. If you look at routes 83, 93 and 103, 17% of all the people in the system ride those routes. So in terms of the uh, need on those routes, um, the level of usage, those are places where um, WISTA can serve a large number of people who need the bus. Um, the other change that we're making with routing is rather minor. Uh, route 95 goes between downtown and West Winston-Salem, and there's a minor adjustment to the route. When we talked to bus operators, uh, they told us we almost never pick up anyone on Nolwood Street, and could we you know, straighten it out a little bit there? And so we're proposing to do that as well, and you'll see that in the maps when we get there. Next slide, please. So, um, Again, talking about where are the routes that are receiving service. There are routes uh, 103, shown here in gold, 83, shown here in blue, and 93, shown here in gray. And as I said earlier, these routes have some of the highest ridership in the system. Um, your average Winston-Salem Transit Authority bus averages about 12 to 13 passengers per hour. All three of these routes average over 20 passengers per hour. Uh, and so um, most buses have about 31 to 33 seats. So that's two-thirds full to maybe more than that uh, most of the time. So you can see why the service is needed. Um, basically, we're offering 30-minute service, which is doubling the frequency to passengers. It shortens uh, wait times for folks, whether they're getting to work, to uh, school, to a medical appointment, or, or just to go shopping or to see friends and family. Uh, the other portion of uh, this improvement that we believe is important is when you look at um, areas of persistent poverty throughout the city of Winston-Salem, um, the largest concentration of census tracts that have been areas of persistent poverty over time are located close to Route 93. And so there's a very high level of need in those neighborhoods. And um, we think this is going to help people who need access to social services, uh, transportation, jobs, education and opportunity, and healthcare. Next, please. Um, on how the service is being added to those three routes, 83, 93, and 103, there are two different ways we could do it. And this is one of the places where we really need your input. Um, there are a couple of scenarios we've put together, option one and option two. In both cases, everywhere where you see green in these slides, uh, the bus would come every 30 minutes instead of every 60 minutes. But one thing we really want to know is, is it more useful to the public to have that service go every 30 minutes from 8 in the morning to 6 p.m.? That's option one. Or would it be more useful to have 30-minute service run kind of at the rush hours that are traditionally the commute hours for, for rush hour in the city, which would be 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. in the morning? and 3 p.m. to 7 p.m. in the evening. Um, so that would mean uh, in option two, in the middle of the day, you'd have 60-minute service from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Then you'd have 30-minute service, and then from 7 p.m. onward, you'd have 60-minute service again. The final proposal, out, the other proposal uh, that's part of option two is to also add some hours that would become 30-minute service on Saturdays at times on 83 and 103, where the bus is most likely to be crowded. And um, our data indicates that those are between 12 and 3 p.m on Saturday in both of those two routes. So as we go through the process, um, if you're uh, looking at this and you're thinking about this, if you can put in the, uh, the chat, if you would prefer option one or option two, that's an incredibly helpful piece of information for us to walk away with this evening. So um, we'll talk about that more later and you can put that in the chat anytime. We'll go to the next slide to talk a little bit more about the changes in detail. Um, eliminating routes 99, 100, 108, and 110. These are the lowest ridership routes in the system. Um, and I think one of the things that's important to know is that we know that when we eliminate a route, we are affecting people's lives. Their buses, even when they are low ridership, people are using them to get to jobs uh, and other opportunities. And so as we've gone through this next portion of the program, we're trying to identify where, what opportunities there are for people to access transportation, even if these routes are going away. Next, please. So um, first, we're going to talk about Route 99. Uh, this is a route that begins up in northern Winston-Salem. Um, uh, 
near University Parkway and Shadowlawn Drive. It comes down, crosses Shadowlawn, goes over to Renolda, comes down to Silas Creek Parkway, and then travels out towards um, Haynes Mall, and then finally towards uh, Forsyth Tech. And um, while this route has been very low productivity, uh, one of the challenges, particularly on productivity, is on Silas Creek Parkway, it's, it's very hard to pick people up because it is more like a highway than a, a city street. And so um, this route would be recycled uh, in terms of if you are somebody who is using Route 99, uh, here are the roads where there are other routes available for you. So if you're on University Parkway, you could use routes 89, 91, and 97 in the same stretch. If you're on Shadowlawn Drive, you could use Route 97. If you're along Renolda Road, you'd have the opportunity to use routes 88 and 109. Uh, for Silas Creek Parkway near Haynes Mall, there's an opportunity to use Route 84. And for those who are headed to Forsyth Tech, you could still use routes 82 and 85 to get to the campus there. Um, finally, down at the bottom here, we don't want to overlook these at all. There are other opportunities out there that are not fixed route bus services. Um, for those who are going to major employers, uh, PART, Piedmont Authority for Regional Transportation, offers a series of van pools that may be able to help you get to your workplace where you ride with four to seven other people in a, a van that uh, one person um, you know, rides and one person drives and everyone else is riding and that's organized on a daily basis for people who are on a regular schedule. Um, the other resource down at the bottom is a website called sharetheridenc.org. Again, that's sharetheridenc.org. And this is a website that's been around for many years, and it's a carpool matching website. So if you're somebody who uh, lives near one of the areas where service is going away and there's not a bus route on that road, you might go there and put in your home address and put in your work address and see if there's somebody who's also looking to make a similar trip. Um, I will add for those of you who haven't used Share the Ride NC. Uh, before. It's not simply for uh, people who are trying to do work commutes. If you're a college student trying to, you know, uh, get from wherever your home is to Winston-Salem State at the beginning of the semester, you could put that in and see if somebody was going that way and could give you a ride as well. Um, let's move to the next route, please. So Route 100 uh, crosses the city, starting over at Winston-Salem State, coming over to Main Street, down towards Silas Creek, uh, comes over towards uh, the western uh, side of Peters Creek, and then goes up towards uh, uh, the hospital area by Hawthorne comes out to the mall and covers some areas that are mostly covered by other routes, and we'll review those here. Um, if you know, we're recommending Route 100 goes away, but along South Stratford Road, uh, riders still have the opportunity to use Route 103. Along Silas Creek Parkway, routes 84 and 85 are available. Um, on Main Street from Watown to East Cemetery Street, there's the opportunity to use Route 104. And then again, for Forsyth Tech, routes 82 and 85 would still be available. Uh, and again, of course, the options with part and share the ride NC are listed below as well. Next, please. Um, Route 108. Uh, Route 108 is in the southeastern part of the city, um, kind of spanning both north and south of I-40, uh, headed a little bit over towards Kernersville along High Point Road, Road. And this is one of the places where we acknowledge that more of the territory that this route serves does not have other alternate services um, to pick folks up. So if you're somebody who would be affected by this change, um, but all the changes in particular, uh, letting us know in the chat, I live on this street, I try to get, to get to work at this location, that type of information can be very helpful in case we make adjustments to the recommendations here. But um, for the what Route 108 elimination, uh, for residents who live along Old Lexington Road and Martyr Road, there's the opportunity to use Route 104. For those who live along Thomasville Road from East Sprague Street to Louise Road, there's the opportunity to use Route 86. And then from Watown Street, from South Martin Luther King Jr. Drive to High Point Road, uh, Route 101 is available as well. And then the next slide, please. The final uh, route recommended for elimination is Route 110. And that is um, you know, kind of here in the heart of the city uh, and then a little bit out to the eastern side. Uh, if you are along 5th Street from downtown to East 4th Street, you can use routes 86, 94, 96, or 105. And if you're along the uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Drive portion of Route 110, you could also use routes 86 and 105. Next slide, please. Um, I talked also about the Route 95 adjustment a few minutes ago. And uh, as you can see here, the red line is what we are proposing the route should do in the future. That little black dotted line is the portion of the route that would be going away. And again, this was something that we um, we heard from uh, bus operators. We also heard from some members of the public through interactions that it was important to try to figure out ways to shorten travel times on the WISTA service. Um, it's been documented that there are some very long trips that folks are making to get from their home to their workplace. And if there are ways to speed up access, um, that helps people get to more jobs in the same amount of time, or it helps them get home faster so they can spend more time with their families. And that's valuable. So this minor adjustment here 
is done in that spirit to test out can we you know look at one minor improvement here that might you know save four to seven minutes each way um, for this one route and if this is received well we might be looking at more of these in the the larger plan that Jeff mentioned later in the year um, the one thing I would note here is that if you are somebody who uh, was using uh, Route 95 along South Stratford Road, you'll still have the opportunity to pick up 103. Um, that's the, the, the adjustment there. Next, please. So stepping away from individual route changes for a moment, let's talk about a couple of things that um, affect you know, anyone who uses Wista. So one of the things that I think everyone on the project team is excited about is the opportunity to introduce a new day pass. Um, and how is an unlimited ride day pass useful if you've never, uh, if you're if you're not someone who regular rides or you haven't had the opportunity to use a day pass before, why is it valuable? And I think the the answer is that it gives people choices throughout their day or if something happens and things change, they can adapt without having to spend more money. Um, I think the primary example that people use the day pass for uh, and in where I am over here in the triangle region, we've had the day pass for, for several years is that um, imagine someone who gets up in the morning, they get on the bus, um, and today they'll spend one dollar to board the bus, and then maybe they on the they go to work. On the way home from work, they pay a dollar to board the bus, and then they go, oh, I, I need to go stop by the grocery store and pick up something for uh, for food for for the family. Well, when they get off the bus and they go into the grocery store, they come out and shop to board the bus. They pay dollar number three to get on just to go home. With the day pass, you pay two dollars in the morning, which is twice the base fare. Um, and the rest of the day, you just swipe. So you pay $2 in the morning. And instead, when you come home in the afternoon, you swipe the day pass again when you get on. And you go into the grocery store and you come out. And this time, you just swipe again. And you don't have to pay for that third trip. So when I think about um, a parent who uh, gets off work and is going to like a parent-teacher conference on an evening at a school, that ride is free for them. If they go to the grocery store on the way home or a church supper on a Wednesday night, that ride home is free for them. So this is a way that anybody across the system um, gets more rides per value of the dollar they put forth. Um, we think that is both equitable and expands opportunity for everybody who uses the system. The other benefit that it has from an operations perspective is that once a day pass is purchased, swiping the pass is much faster than putting a dollar in. So if um, a lot of people are using day passes, you will find that people are able to board faster, which can speed up the buses because there's less time waiting to get people paying at the fare box and in. So that can both help travel times and it can improve on-time performance for the system. Next, please. Um, the next thing that I think is an exciting innovation here is a new ticket vending machine coming to the Clark Transportation Center. When uh, our project team spoke to the city council back in the fall, one of the things that the council um, asked uh, us about was, do we have the opportunity to have more choices for buying tickets at the, the Clark Transportation Center? Um, sometimes there's a line to the window. Um, and sometimes people have credit cards or they have, um, you know, uh, bills like bills they can pay out of their, their wallet and um, don't need to speak to somebody. And this allows somebody to get in, make that purchase and get out and catch their bus quickly. And so um, this is something that will be coming later in the year, but it also helps. Uh, it, it provides a little bit extra customer service. It allows people to uh, purchase with a credit card and it makes just another option for using the bus easier. Next, please. And so I guess at an overarching level, why are these the service changes we 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 brought forward. When we had uh, some guidance from the city council, we tried to be responsive to what they told us. And some of the things that we heard last year in the fall when we spoke with the council about this study were that we want WISTA to serve more people. We want WISTA to pick up as many people as possible with the dollars we spend. Uh, and that's why you see us looking at shifting resources from routes that have fewer riders to routes that may have more. Um, the second thing is trying to shorten trips. Can we speed up getting people to work, getting people to school, to healthcare and things like that. And so that adjustment with 95, we wanna try that and see how that goes. And I think if we're successful, we will do more in the next round of recommendations, which should be a little bit more comprehensive to see how we can speed up rides for everybody um, in other parts of the city. Uh, the final part here is that Worcester wants to be a, a bit more innovative here on fare technology. And we've identified both the day pass and the ticket machine as ways that we can do that, um, giving people more opportunities to pay in different ways, uh, to pay with the day pass in a different way that gives them extra rides at no additional cost. Um, and we believe that these innovations on the fair side will both make it easier to pay and we believe will support ridership growth, which gets back to that top goal of how do we serve more people with the resources that WISTA has. Next, please. I want to talk here about the service change timeline and where we are in it next. So um, back in March, we advertised the public comment period, which began on April 10th. Um, Matt Deshan made an initial presentation to the WISTA board on March 30th. 
Um, we opened the comment period on April 10th, and we've been getting email, and uh, there have been comments on Facebook, and uh, Tina at WISTA is doing a great job collating that for us. Uh, at the top there in the center, that blue dot, the virtual public meeting, that's where we are right now. Um, if you have somebody, like perhaps if you're here this evening and you know somebody who uses the bus who couldn't be here, you can tell them about it. They still have opportunity to provide more comments to um, this process by May 10th. Um, and then between May 10th and May 18th, um, we have the opportunity as a project team to perhaps adjust the recommendations before we go to city council. And you see that asterisk above city council items due May 18th. This is the bottom down here. It says your input is important. Adjustments may be made to the study recommendations submitted to city council based on comments received from the public. So what you say here tonight, uh, what your friends and neighbors say when they send us an email or leave us a message um, can help shape and change what we finally bring forward on May 18th. Uh, assuming we have those recommendations in, uh, June 13th will be a presentation to Public Works and the full council would vote on June 20th. And then later this year, the day pass, the ticket machine and those service changes that we reviewed earlier would take place. Um, next, please. And then I, I think I reviewed some of this, but I'll cover it because it's, it's here on the screen. Um, through May 10th, uh, our comment period is open. If you go home tonight, you have a new idea saying, hey, I wish I had said X. Um, you could certainly come back and uh, you could call the number. Uh, if you have a comment card and you're there in the room tonight, we'd love for you to fill it out. Uh, if you're online and you're in the Zoom chat and you have questions or comments, we'd love for you to drop those in the chat this evening. Uh, there's the number here on the screen, which is 336-747-6983. Um, there's a website comment form at movewinstonsalem.com slash contact us. You can also uh, email Matthew Deshan, our project manager, and his email is on the screen there as well. And um, next slide, please. I think that's the, this is the end of our formal presentation. And really, we're here to take questions um, from the public. So I'm going to stop there. And uh, Crystal, let me turn to you. How do you want to process questions and, and work on this? What's the best way to do this? Sure, so um, we'll take them in the order we received. Um, first, um, we have one through the Q&A, and then I do see that we have um, one person online raising their hand. So we'll take uh, Judy Hayes' question right after that. Um, so the first question that was submitted, um, my question concerns the policy and process for establishing trans aid services for people with disabilities. I have been trying to get services for my sister since February. The last word we heard was that the safety assessment was taking place. That was over a month ago. How do we expedite this process? Okay, so thank you for that question, Casey. Um, I think I may want to turn to um, Donna, who I think is there in the room, who may have a better opportunity to answer this question than me. and. Um, Karen, is it possible yes. to engage Donna for this one? Yes, I'm going to get her on the microphone. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you. Um, I will address that question in reference to the trans aid application process. It normally takes about 21 days to respond and get an approval or denial or and a reason why. So what I can do is if you can provide your contact information in the chat, I will make sure that we reach out to you and find out what the status is of that application because you should have received a response by now. Um, I apologize for that not happening, but we will take that in consideration and respond to you tomorrow if I can get your contact information. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. And Crystal, you said there was an individual with their, ra their hand raised? Yes. Judy, you are, I have just sent here. I'm gonna ask for you to unmute. Hey. Hello. Hi. Um, how y'all doing tonight? Doing well, Judy. Good to have you here. Yeah. <clears throat> My name is Judith Hayes, and um I'm concerned about the bus route. Um it's 106 and one um 109. Um, I live in Isaiah Terrace and I have problem with walking and I have to walk from my apartment to all the way down the hill up to Trey Street to catch a bus. And um, my concern is, is that when you get off 109 or 106, you get off again at Trey Street and you have to walk across the street 
And then I have to walk down the street and up a hill um, to home. And my concern is that there's no bus stop on Northwest Boulevard at all. What's between Trey Street and Northwest Boulevard, when you turn the corner, there's no bus stop. And also, there's no bus stop on Northwest Boulevard, like going towards um, Trey Street. Like if I want to catch a bus to go downtown, I have to walk to Trey Street. Instead, they should have a bus stop right long somewhere before you get to Trey Street so I can catch it. And most of the people that live in Kimberly Park that lives over on like the Glen Avenue side back to a, they have to walk all the way from that area, all the way to Northwest Boulevard and turn on trade to catch a bus. Okay. No, great, great comment there. When you think about, um, <clears throat> when you think about the place where you and your neighbors would ideally like a bus stop to be, is there an intersection that you think would be most favorable? Um, the only little intersection it is, is trade in Northwest Boulevard. I would think that it would be good to put a bus stop. Like if you're going, if you turn in left, wait a minute, let me get it right. If you turn in left onto trade street, I mean, onto Northwest Boulevard from trade. No, if you turn it, I want to get it right. Let me, excuse me. Let me make sure I get it right with my direction. So if I'm coming down Trey Street and I make a right on north onto Northwest Boulevard, there should be a bus sign, a bus stop right there, somewhere in that area, passing the store that's on that corner. Should be a bus stop right there. And if I was coming from let's say Clock Street and I needed to catch a bus to downtown, I think it should be a bus stop, a bus stop right there along that area. Hello? Oh, well, we're listening. Uh, hey, Crystal, is it okay if I share the screen for a second? Sure thing, Patrick, take the wheel. Yeah, so I wanna make sure that we're speaking, we're understanding Ms. Hayes' question very well. Ms. Hayes, I'm trying to pull up a map here to make sure I'm getting your question here correctly. Here's the intersection of Trade Street and Northwest Boulevard. Okay, um, wait a minute. Let me make it big so I can see it from my okay. end. Okay, sure. <laughs> okay, wait a minute. Okay, I see, I see right there. So is this the intersection where you think it would be better to have something closer by Northwest Discount here at the intersection? Is that the, the idea? Um, no, somewhere about like where Dairy Street at. I think you should put a bus sign right there. Cause okay. it'll take the people that's even going, I mean, like if they get out from work or whatever, I think it'll cover most of the people that's in Camp Kimberly, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. and Okay, now, on Northwest Boulevard, coming get, before they turn on Trey Street, about right there, across from Gary, I think it should be a bus stop right there for to accommodate the people that's going to, going downtown. Okay. So, no, that's great. And I think um, this is the type of input we love to get to figure out how we make routes work best for better for neighborhoods. And while we can't, you know, do any immediate action for this tonight, what I can say is that um, one of the things that have been part of the studies is a, a bus stop placement policy that um, we've been working on for WISTA. And we could probably, uh, you know, Matt, we've been thinking about, is there a bus stop that we could sort of take through the process as like a, a candidate to see what, you know, how the process will perform. Um, this this stop here might be a perfect test case to see look at what the benefits of it um, and any drawbacks that there might be. Um, but Ms. Hayes, I, I appreciate that. We could look into that here. Is there any other bus stop? Like, well, we can look at this Darien Northwest question. Is there any other location that you think we should look into a stop? Yeah, um, like bus 109, um, when it makes a right onto Northwest Boulevard, 
there again, there's no bus stop there on Northwest Boulevard. And the only bus stop would be is that once that bus turned onto um, Patterson Avenue, it stops right there at Family Dollar. To me, I feel like it should also be a bus stop right there before 109 turns onto Patterson, I mean, onto Patterson Avenue, just in case if a person wanna get out and go up Patterson, like towards the submerging, um, the submerging or something like that, I think that'll help, especially with people with disability like me with the walking. Sure. No, we can we can take a look at the Patterson location as well. I think the last thing is um, for individuals with disabilities, um, there may be an opportunity to use TransAid. And have you ever looked into that previously? No, I no, I haven't looked into TransAid. I get so many bad uh, rumors about TransAid. So I'm going to look into it, though. And also, before I close with y'all guys, I want to put this out here. Um, <clears throat> my doctor um, is over there. My doctor is over there off of Haynes Mall Boulevard and over there on Ca um, Camel Drive. And the earliest bus that I can get in the morning time, I think it's about 517. Is there some kind of way that you could get a bus to come a little earlier without me? Because once I get to the mall, when I get downtown, I have to catch a bus to the mall. Once I get to the mall, I have to wait for another bus to get where I need to go. Okay. And you said, um, do you know the the address of the doctor? You said it was on Camel Drive? Yes. The spine specialist. Spine specialist on Camel Drive. Okay. Okay. Um, I think these are, so I just want to say that these comments are excellent. These are all things that we can look into and investigate as we think about um, not only the, I think for the quick wins here, this might be, you know, not the best venue, but in those bigger, you know, we've, we talked a little bit ago about how we're trying to speed rides up, right? How can you get yes, to medical sir. appointments without taking too much time? You know, can yes. you in that trip, can we do the trip with fewer transfers? We're going to be looking at some of those questions later in the years. And this type of comment is really helpful to help us think about it. So thank, thank you. you, sir. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. Crystal, what else do we have? Okay. Um, online, we have another attendee that asked, did the study look into why widership was low for the, some of these routes versus the other routes? That's a great question. Um, so Figuring out that a route has lower ridership than another is comparatively easy to figure comparatively easier to figuring out the why. And there, there are a couple of things that we can do to try to get at that question. Um, one of the things that has, of course, made I think just about everything about transportation and maybe everything about life harder the last couple of years is that the pandemic has changed a lot of people's transportation needs and behaviors. And so um, one thing that has been a challenge in the last year and a half in particular, not simply in Winston-Salem, but everywhere that, you know, people try to answer these questions, is that a lot of the data we have about how people travel from the census, the, the most recent data sets are from 2018, 2019, before COVID kind of shuffled the world in, in so many ways. Um, that said, even knowing that that has changed, there are plenty of people for whom the pandemic did not change travel patterns. And so um, one of the ways that we try to look at the why is we try to look at um, census data of where people live and where they go to work. Uh, there is a um, tool. If anybody really wants to, to get into this in their own exploration, there's a tool called On the Map. And I will put the link in the chat. And what that allows anybody to do, but those of us who use it professionally, we take a look at like the city of Winston-Salem and we'll start with, uh, you can divide people into sort of lower income, middle income and higher income. And when we think about folks who depend on the bus, they're more likely to be in the middle income and lower income categories. And so when we were looking at the routes that we were thinking about that might be you know, eliminated or recycled into other services like we're recommending here this evening, um, some of the places that were the better candidates for their low ridership and those routes might need to be recycled into something else for places that had a higher percentage of higher income residents in their census tracts. Um, and we also tried to look at places where um, 
people who lived in one part of town uh, were going to work. And some of the LEHD data, and again, I'll put that link to the on the map tool, can help us get a, a grant, a big picture, um, but not a perfect picture. We, you know, we it, those of us who analyze data would love to know like where everybody wakes up in the morning and everybody goes, but we rarely have that type of data. Um, so we do look at the, the ridership counts that we see at the fare box through things like uh, automated passenger counters on buses that have them. But then we also look at sources like census data to think about who may be um, more likely to have a car at home if they don't take the bus, you know, one day. And um, perhaps the reasons why, you know, the ridership is low in some areas is that that's an area of town that has higher car ownership. Um, I hope that answers the question, but if, if there's a follow-up, I'd be glad to take it too. Patrick, could you also speak to the feedback we got from the bus operator survey? Sure. Um, I think that's a great point. We got feedback from operators on several different types of um, you know, changes in the system. What, what would they like to see uh, different? What do they think is working well? Uh, we, we got all sorts of very, um, very different types of feedback. Sometimes it was very global. Things like, um, I, don't, I drive 100 several days a week. There are sometimes I, ride the, I drive the bus three times in a row and I don't pick anybody up. So sometimes we would get stuff like that from the operators. On 95, we had, I think, seven different operators say, I never pick up anyone on the Nolwood Street. Can we, you know, straighten things out there? And that's how that 95 recommendation got into our packet this time. Um, other things that we hear are, uh, this left turn is really hard and it makes the bus late. Can we do something about that? Um, I see from Karen that we have several folks who would like to speak. So, um, yeah, let's go to, to some of those folks. Great. I think the way we're going to do this, um, if you, I believe you're first, this gentleman, if you wouldn't mind coming up and stating your name and then uh, speaking here into the mic and ask your question or make your comment. Yes. Yes. All right. How you doing? Um, hey there. You face everybody. Oh, face. Yeah. Okay. Um, my name is Herbert Ricks. Um, I've got, actually, I've got a lot of questions, but I'm going to keep it, I'm going to keep it real <laughs> short for right now. My first question is about the, the, I understand with the 99 and the 100 about the need to get rid of those. I work at Forsyth Tech. The 99, there's hardly ever anyone on it. So I understand that it goes through Silas Creek Parkway and is always late because of the traffic. Um, but for Forsyth Tech, if you eliminate the 99 and the 100, then you only got one bus that goes through there. And then that bus only runs once an hour. Now you mentioned the 82 on there, but the 82 is like an east side, it's like a it's like a circulator. So that's not going through town. So at least with the 99, you can take that to Sturmer Park. Um, and then you can catch it downtown from there. So what if you I, I, again I understand the need to get rid of the 99 and 100 because there's not much ridership, but if you do, then there's only one bus and it's only going to run once an hour from the college. And working there, we do have a lot of students that want to go that want to take the bus. Um but they, feel, they already feel it's not convenient. So to eliminate that, then it's gonna make it even less convenient. So is there any, I guess, option of maybe increasing the route for the 85, maybe run twice now? Um, for the route 85, you said? Right. Okay, so I think that's something we could take a look at. Um, one of the things I think, um, so first of all, I wanna say I really appreciate this question. And I really appreciate the details you're bringing here because this really helps us think it through. Um, I think you make a, an excellent point that if 82 is a circulator, that's not really connecting to another transfer hub like Sturmer Park or downtown. It, it does mean it's less, you know, less useful than something that would connect to a bigger transfer point elsewhere in the city. And this is where I think the, the bigger plan that, uh, the, the, the more sort of like master plan for the system that we're thinking about in later in the year. And as the, the sort of the final result is more likely to address questions like that holistically. I think um, one of the things we could huddle with with the team is whether or not we think that um, there's a way to do something like what you're talking about on the 85. Um, are there particular hours where you feel like going from 60 minute to 30 minute on 85 would be particularly helpful to students? Um, I don't. We could look at that because I'm on yeah. that where we're trying to get more ridership from students because we have a lot of students that have problems getting there um, that may not have a car. So we are always looking at that. So I can, you know, we can address that, but I know there is a, there is a need. Yeah. Take away more, more buses would 
kind of diminish that need. No, and you make you make very good points. Um, I think if there's ways that we could get a sense, um, and, and do you work for the do you work for the community college? I do. Okay. Um, I don't know if there's an opportunity to maybe so. So one thing that we've done um, in other cities that I've worked in is sometimes getting uh, like uh, basically it's like an address database, right? And what happens is the the college will strip out all the names of all the the individuals who are currently enrolled for that semester. And they'll send us, um, you might even, you, you probably have a, a person who can do GIS at the college that could geocode them and then like strip that data out so it has nobody's personal identif identification information. But then we see on dots on a map um, where people live. I think the other possibility is if you guys can't geocode that yourselves and we're comfortable sending us a list, we could try to geocode it as part of our work. Um, if the individual addresses is still a little bit uncomfortable to the college, just getting a count by there are this many people in this zip code and that zip code, it's not quite as good, but it could be helpful. Any of those types of things. Um, and like if there are sort of tides for a certain set of classes, like maybe Tuesday, Thursday afternoon classes or your busiest time on campus, knowing things like that can be helpful too. So um, I don't have any answers for you here this evening. I can say that um, we'd love to be in a problem solving posture with you. And Matt is the best person to communicate through on that. And then he can help us work, you know, with you to try to figure out answers to that question. If not in the in this quick win um, uh, portion of the study, in the bigger study, I think we should absolutely be looking at this question. That's one more question, or should I come back and no? come back? Go ahead, you're go for it. All right, I'm <laughs> so I got a lot of them, but this is, this is, all right. So since you mentioned about the new um, the two day the the one day pass and putting in the new box, I think my first question is what happened with the with next bus. Next bus was really good as far as like knowing when the bus, like being able to track when the bus was coming. And then one day it stopped working and it never came back. So, I mean, to have that would be good. Um, I know other cities um, use an app called um, Umo. And I know that's tied into Greensboro's bus, High Point and Park, where instead of using cash or using a pass all the time, you actually purchase everything through your phone. I mean, it's good to, there are all walks of life to take the bus. Some people aren't as technologically savvy. So it's good to have those options of still having cash and stuff, but also to be more innovative, you know, with the app, you purchase everything on your phone, you scan it on the box on your phone and you keep going. It's not the need to have the passes because one of the problems with the bus passes is like, I get the 30 day bus passes sometimes. You get the 30 day bus pass two weeks in, and the ink is rubbed off and you don't know when the date is. So, I mean, just some, just some other things to be innovative um, in order to like make it easier for people, not always having to go in and purchase things with cash. Everybody doesn't use cash anymore. Some people still do, but everyone does. Mm -hmm. No, so also a great question. Um, I think what you're talking about with paying by phone is a, a technology that's increasingly referred to as mobile ticketing. Um, I'm doing some work for the city of Pittsburgh right now. And when I board the bus at the airport, um, I, I scan my phone because they have a, what's called a validator there. Um, I feel like I should turn this over to Donna because I know she's talked about um, the timeline of what's going on with NextBus. And just so you know, NextBus has had the same issue in other cities. Um, it's not simply a Winston-Salem thing, but perhaps Donna, could you talk about uh, the real time, and then also the question about whether or not there's mobile ticketing in sort of the capital plan. Yes, and um, for NextBus, as Patrick stated, NextBus is a problem for several agencies, not just once in cycle. Uh, when they upgraded the technology, we were no longer able to support it. So it wasn't an issue that was actually a WISTA issue, but a next plus issue. However, we have partnered with Park, Greensboro, High Point, and about two other agencies on a new AVL system, which is an automatic vehicle locator. And that company is called GMV. So we're in the last phases of our contract and we will have that technology, which will have the AVL lock, um, locator. And then we also, include other features. The mobile app is something that is um, is in our capital plan. So we do intend on having that. So we have multiple options for people to have cash 
cash free system. But we do know that some people do still will have to pay with cash. And then, but the upgrade that we're potentially doing now would be the ticket vending machines to allow people to purchase passes with their debit card or credit card. So that's an increase of an improvement for efficiency purposes. But we do have in our recent and near future, the GMV synchromatics that will provide the AVL locator that will replace next bus and it will be more efficient. Yeah. Do you have any kind of timeline on when the app or anything will roll out as far as the tracking? The app, as far as the tracking, uh, well, the GMV, that, that will be before the end of this year, but I don't want to give a specific date um, because I don't want to overpromise and underdeliver. But we do have the, that will be coming soon. Can't say that. All right. Hopefully before the fiscal year, which will be July. All right. All right. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great answer, Donna. And I just want to validate, you know, here in my backyard here, sometimes I, I rode uh, both Go Triangle and Chapel Hill Transit yesterday. And Chapel Hill Transit also had next bus. And my understanding that the uh, gentleman who's the uh, director there, he said that all the modems we had on our buses from next bus were 3G. And so when AT&T threw the switch from 3G to 5G, all of our stuff died the next morning um, and didn't come back on. So uh, again, just kind of something where the, the tech, unfortunately, left a lot of um, transit providers in the situation. And Donna here has been proactive in, you know, going out to get the GMV contract working. So um, great question. Great answer. Uh, let me see. If, um, Herbert, if you got some more. Uh, yeah, we've got we've got a couple more. Uh, but I, but I, I want to make sure are there other folks there who have questions, too. We can come back to Herbert, too. We have. Yes. Would you like to come up here? Do you want me to bring it down there? Yeah. Okay. Okay. And if you don't mind stating your name, that would help us. Okay, I'm Ernestine Crawford. And I live over in the complex where the lady was on there in that uh, Azale apartments over there for Trade Street where she was saying she was in the wheelchair. Now it is a problem because I stay in Providence and Providence is right in their area. I moved in that area in 1993, and I've been there ever since because we buy it's a home location that before the projects was where the projects was there when I moved in. But what she is talking about, absolutely correct. I myself has had two hip replacements. Now my knees are bothering. I also have had to deal with cancer. So we do have to walk our way down trade. And it's a hill from mm -hmm. hell. I'm just mm -hmm. gonna say it that. is. <laughs> and then if you don't go that way, you gonna have to go all the way around by City Hot Dog from where I live in. Now, where the resident we used to have the bus stop was on Trade and Five Royals, because that's what street I stay on, Five Royals, and that's where our bus stop was. All of a sudden, the bus stopped left, and we was like, what in the world done happened? <laughs> but now that we are much older, because I said I moved in 1993, and we all are much older. We got more health problems now. And everybody don't want to ride in the cars. We love to get on the bus. I know me and my family, this is a traditional thing we do. Get on the bus, and you want to go to the mall or wherever. Just, just mm -hmm. continue to see what's the same. What's the same has improved itself a lot. But the best stop was she, she couldn't give you a best stop, but I can. And the best stop is Five <laughs> Royals and Trade. That's the best stop for her and for the people that stay. Providence is a whole different area. We up here are more like the railroad track, closer to the post office. But like I say, walking that long route is hard, and I can't do it. So is there this, I hope there's a, a blessing <laughs> that a bus route <laughs> will be on five roasters and trade. That's where we all used to catch it. Even when it snow, it's a hill, but this, the hill always got fixed up before the residence because that was a bus route. So it wasn't trouble for the buses coming that way. I, to the day, don't know why it stopped. And I, I still can't figure it out. And it's also a nursing home over there. I don't know if y'all knew it or not, but it's a lot of elderly people that live over there. Everybody don't want to get on transit. A lot of those mm -hmm. people be evil by the time they get home. You know, wait at an hour, and I have tra tra <laughs> transit. That's not that's not me. I, I can't do it. So I'd rather get on the city bus. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Okay. No, no, Ernestine, I appreciate the comment very much. And I just want to make sure I'm capturing what you said correctly. I just put on the screen, um, Five Royals Drive and Trade. Is this the location you're talking about here? Yes, that's where I stay at. I stay on Five Royals. Okay, okay, good. Um, no, this is great. And I think, you know, same, I think it's the same response I would have to um, uh, the gentle lady who shared the comment earlier in the evening, which right. is we've got that stop process that we've been um, working on with Wista. And these two stops are probably a great uh, pair of investigations for us to look at as part of the, the bigger master plan coming later this year. So getting this type of input is perfect. It's wonderful to have you sharing this here. Um, and, uh, you know, this is something we can be looking into. I can't, I can't give you any answers tonight, but we will definitely take a look at this. Okay, yeah, because that was the original stop. When I moved over there, it was there, but the projects was there. Mm -hmm. And everybody kept asking me why I wanted my home built near the projects. <laughs> I wanted a home. I didn't care where it was built. <laughs> but I knew I had a bus stop, which I used to catch that bus and go to Haynes because I worked on Haynes on Haynes Mill. Mm -hmm. So I could, I could catch the bus and I got to work on time. But like I said, it just moved and why, I have no idea. Mm -hmm. But it needs to be put back. <laughs> <laughs> oh great uh, it's, <laughs> it's five uh, royals and trade up the hill <laughs> all right no we're all right. Getting, uh, and Aaron, um, what else do you have there we're getting some great feedback i got um i see judy's hand raised again did you want to chime back in on that comment judy um yes go right ahead ma'am can you hear me yes, yes ma'am Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> um, I think bus 109 will um accommodate the lady that spoke up about speak was speaking up about fire roar. I think bus 109, since you don't have a bus stop going up towards North, I mean Patterson, I think bus 109 should go down Trade Street. Okay. Another good suggestion for us to look into. Now, this is, you guys are like problem solving as a team. I love it. Um, Thank you. Just one second. I've got Donna here. Just, uh, we just wanted to um, comment on that. I believe the route that you're referring to, Judy, is Route 106 instead of Route 109. So that does come up Trade Street. No. No, I'm talking about the 109 um, that Ghost, I mean, I'm talking about coming from downtown um, and keeping straight up Trade Street, like down to Glen. Yes, that's 106. No, ma'am, that's 109. Uh, 91. 91. 91. 91. I mean, 91. I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> yes. sorry. 91. Thank you. I'm, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We got you. <laughs> I'm sorry. 91. 91. Mm -hmm. All right. I think the most important thing I heard there from Judy is that the thing that would be attractive is some a bus going from downtown straight up trade to Glen. Is that right, Judy? And then yes, and it'll help accommodate for the people that's at the lower part of where um the old Boston projects used to be. And the people that's up up, up on up a little farther, it'll accommodate them too. It'll help them a lot. Okay. No, great comments here. Um, We've got a couple more. Yeah, Karen, just keep them coming. This is terrific. This gentleman right here. Okay. One, two. Okay. If you'd state your name. Oh, my name is Edison Martin. Can you say that one more time? Edison Martin. Okay. Thank you. And, uh, and I was looking at what y'all thought about feeling on that rap number three, on that 93. 93 come down 25th Street, make a right and go all the way around and sit. I want to know why he can't go up the hill, up the hill, all the way up and come and, and go uh, uh, up there near Born Boulevard, Born Park, and come down. And you, uh, he wouldn't have to burn all that time. He got to pull up downtown 10 minutes. They got to pull over here 10 minutes. They got to pull over down the hill 10 minutes. Come on now. You want, you talking about, you want to uh, 
uh, help the people put the bus where the people hit it. Well, they didn't get it. Not on no wheel. They not walk down the hill. Walk down the hill. That's all I got. That's what I want to say. Somebody might not like that, but I'm going to tell you what it was. Once upon a time, that was the old Council Height route. Here was the old Council right. You go up the hill, make a turn, go that way, go down, go, go down, come back around Boulevard, and, and, and go right back, and go right back. But you, you say you got no time. Ten minutes, him. Ten minutes, there. And ten minutes, you got to wait. Well, he can't go nowhere that 30 minutes. That 30 minutes. You can take that 30 minutes and make you and make you work. You can do that. You really, you really can. If you really want to help the people, do this. Don't, don't talk about it, do it. No, th thank you for that comment, sir. And, uh, you got a book drop right on the corner. Uh, uh, you walk right on the corner. The book got the book got the turn right there. Got to get off. You got to get right back on three eleven. Back on three eleven. Don't you know that? That's the danger. That, that, that thing, thanks, my old funeral road. That thing's is right there, that bug top hill. I got to walk there one time. You got to look up. You got to look down. You got to keep looking. Whoever put that bug top, now you can move that bug top to <laughs> the jetway. If you take that bug top to the jetway, you can move back to eat day to get rid of that death trap right there. Somebody's gonna get hurt right there. Karen, I was trying to get the I heard the gentleman say that there's a bus stop where the bus is getting on and off 311 and that it's dangerous, but I couldn't get the cross street. Is there a cross street with 311 so that we can isolate that bus stop so we can take a look into it? Do you want to answer that one? No. Nope. Okay. What was the crossroad? He was uh oh Greensboro Road, uh -huh. Patrick. Yeah, right there. And the bug got right in there. And I don't know who put that thing right there. You're telling the one has got some apartments behind Okay. And, and is, is, it, is it a particular route or multiple routes, Karen? That's a concern there. 96. 96. 96. Okay. 96. And, and, That's helpful. And, and, and you got older people. You got older people can't walk that fuck. Mm -hmm. I think you, he was also just saying 93 had a lot of room in the route. Right. And you could extend it. In the, in, instead of the bus sitting, you could yeah. penetrate more of the neighborhood and you would get more people served. Yeah. Yeah, I think the gentleman said that the bus is waiting for 10 minutes in one spot and 10 minutes in another and that it, that slack could be used to help access more area? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes, a whole lot. Route 93. 93. Okay, I just want to make sure I got that correct. I thought that's what I heard, so good. Um, no, thanks, sir. Thank you for those comments, and um, we can take uh, we can take those concerns back and see what we can look at look into for them. I appreciate that, Patrick. I have a couple more too. Okay, sure. let me see you, sir. And you want to state your name? Yes, my name is Timothy Scott. I stay in Salem Crest Apartments. I work at night. Uh, my question may be important, may not be important, but at this time, since October fifteenth. I think 20, 2021 or 2022, when uh, the night services were suspended. I've done a spreadsheet of how much I'm spending on cab fare. And it's currently at 600 some odd dollars per month. And that's just to get home. And right now I'm really just wondering how much longer I don't have the credit where I can just get a car right away. I just want to know how long am I to hold on? That's my question. And that's also one third of my income. That's just going out for something that I'm not getting any equity on other than just a little bit of friendly conversation. That's it. 
I just want an answer. How long will we going to be waiting for a night service or what? Is it terminated completely? Whatever. Let us know something. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Patrick, I'll let um, Donna answer that one. You want to take? There you go. Um, Mr. Timothy. Yes, ma'am. I, I, I totally sympathize with you. Yes, ma'am. I, I, I wrote the so I definitely understand. Yes, I, I did. Right. And I understand. I understand your anger. Um, I don't want to tell you that it's going to start back tomorrow. But what I will tell you is that we, the staff at Winston, we are aggressively we changed our policy as it relates to how we're advertising the jobs so that we can hire more drivers so that we can bring that service back. To answer your question, yes, it is coming back. It is going to come back as soon as we're able to put the service out there so we know that we can put it out there and it can be sustained. Mm -hmm. We don't want to put it out there and then have to take it back. So that's like a T. So we feel like it's more efficient if we put the service back out there when we have enough drivers that we can actually run it and not have to suspend the route due to no driver for that day or that week or for that month. So we have been having new hire classes um, as frequently as uh, every other month we are hiring. We started a class on Monday and we have actually 18 drivers in that class. And we have not had a large class like that in years. So we're really happy about that. We're hopeful that we can get them through the process to obtain their license and their credentials so that they can maintain. And that will put us really close to the point where we need to restore that service. So we do look forward to come back this year. But I, again, I won't tell you what day because I don't know. I have to be honest. Um, but we will have that service restored as soon as possible. We know that it's a negative effect on everyone. And it affects us as well because we're here to do a service for you. And we can't do what we need to because we don't have the drivers to supply the service that's needed right now. But as soon as possible, we will have that service returned to the street. And if we can get your contact information, we would. I would like for us to see if there's any other alternatives for you um, to get home without paying that $600 a month. If we can do something to assist. I don't know if there's a route in that area or whatever, but we can... We have uh, Salem Crest is nothing. Mm -hmm. In fact, after seven o'clock, nothing. Nothing's on Sunday. Mm -hmm. We need to look into that as well. Um, I don't want to make any promises that I can't keep, but I will tell you that I'm committed to looking at some other alternatives um, until we can get the service back out there. So, so hold on, hold on. So, I'd like to add to your uh, to your point, Mr. Timothy. Um, one, please document this concern on our comment card. But two, do you have the time of day? One, I didn't hear that, that you said night service, but particularly, can you explain the need that you're dealing with as far as a time of service? When I, when I first started my job, I just needed to be 80, I needed 85, which was no problem. But I needed the, the eight, no, I needed the 83, which was no problem. Now I need the 93 and the 85. I'm able to catch 93 during the morning time to get to my job, but it's when I get off. That's when I have a problem. And what time is that? That's uh, eight o'clock. Eight o'clock. And I think that, that's what, thank you for that. So we've got the routes, we've got the times, and right, this is an allocation of staff hours. <coughs> and how, we, how do we figure out how to allocate those hours as part of why we're here tonight? So if it's a driver issue with staff availability and how we allocate the staff for those man hours, we need to document where the need is. So that's what we're asking you to do. So thank you for that. And, and Jeff, can I just add one more request to uh, Mr. Timothy, who I really appreciate sharing his experience. If he could um, give you or Donna the address of his um, work site, that can help us too. Um, because okay. knowing that could help us <clears throat> strategize. Okay, and we'll get that Patrick. And I've got one more. Okay, state your, okay, state your name. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, Mr. Patrick. Uh, my first uh, thing I want to respond to is uh, y'all talking about eliminating Route 95. I think we actually should keep Route 95. Um, actually, I just I just filed a complaint uh, pertaining to Route 95. Yes, ma'am. I just want to, I don't mean to cut you off. Yes, ma'am. Clarify, we're not eliminating 95. Okay, oh, yeah, not. No, 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 sir. We're okay. not going just. We're proposing not to go on Norwood Street. Okay. But 95 is going to remain. Okay. 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 Um, my suggestion on the 95, Ms. Donna, 
Could we get better drivers on the 95? Better drivers. Okay. Um, but other, the other thing that I want to respond to, I put in several complaints. I'm glad that you're here, Ms. Donald. I put in several complaints with Muslim and Seven Transit, and the complaints seem to not go anywhere. I've been riding uh, Muslim and Seven Transit since 2000, and I think I met with you on one occasion, and the Lord took care of that situation. So, but I'm saying if you hire better drivers, mm. that probably would solve a whole lot of problems that you have. Better drivers, people who enjoy working, people who enjoy doing their job, we, the public, we get a better response from that. So that will help us out a whole lot. Okay, um, the next thing I want to respond to, um, y'all thinking about eliminating some routes or changing some routes? Because I know it's a, lot, a whole lot of people riding buses, a whole lot of people are riding buses now. But the thing that we're dealing with is the attitude of your drivers. The disposition that a lot of your drivers have. Can I, can I get some input on that? Yes. I didn't want to cut you off. No, no, no. Wait for you. So yes, we have met and we did discuss the issue that you had at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and apparently that's been resolved. Mm -hmm. So if you have additional comments or concerns that have not been addressed, I can definitely take that information. Uh, we do have a complaint process and it is not being responded to appropriately, you have my contact information um, so that I can follow up on that. But as far as hiring better drivers, we um, I need to identify what type of behaviors you're saying that the drivers are doing and if that could be investigated. To We have all types of things in place to address anyone that violates any policies. And we are very, very responsive to anyone that has a, a, a complaint or valid complaint about customer service. Customer service is number one just as long as, uh, right along with safety. And I promise you that's what we stand on. So when we find that any of our employees, drivers, customer service, anyone is violating the customer's customer service needs, that's an important thing to address immediately. So if you have those details, we have staff here available tonight to take that and respond to that appropriately. But also we have training in place. Um, we have our training manager here. We do sensitivity training because just like you all are people, our, our drivers are people. Everybody has challenges, so we want to train them and help them because when you come to work, you come to work with a lot. So we have a lot of responsibility and a lot of ask for our drivers, but also one of the things that we do require is that if they need anything to help them to do their jobs better, then we have to be there to provide that. So we can address those co uh, comments that you have and make sure that those complaints get taken care of. Okay, thank you. Uh, the only thing, Ms. Donald, that we're asking from the public that we're asking y'all to do is to do your job. Yes. That's, how, that's what your drivers get paid to do, right? So when we get on the bus, when we pay our fare, when we slide our car, whatever we do, we don't need that excess back talk. Mm. And when I say this, a lot of this is coming from your female drivers. I'm a Christian man, so when I get on the bus, I'm going to say, good morning. I'm going to say, good afternoon. I'm going to say, how you doing? That's pretty much that's it. I don't think that's asking too much. But all that extra stuff, we don't need that. All we need for them to do is just do their job. For us to have to go through all these changes as a patron, to go to City Hall, to do all that for your drivers, we shouldn't have to do that. Got to get paid a good salary to just drive the bus. That's all we ask them to do, just drive the bus. Get us safely from point A to point Z. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Does anybody else have any comments? Yes. Okay. We've got a few more. Patrick. Sure. Okay. And if you don't mind stating your name. Okay. Hi, I won't take up much of your time. I'm Latonya Wright. I'm actually a member of the transit board, and it makes me very happy to be a part of that board because it's been so fascinating learning how the inner workings of the system actually works. I've rode the bus all my life, and so it's nice to kind of have the curtain pulled back and see what all that looks like. I'm not familiar enough with the buses that are having the changes um, to comment on that. I do think the day pass looks like a good idea. That'll save a lot on printing costs alone just for the transfers itself, and will save people a lot of money going and coming too. Uh, this is basically just one more well, one comment and then one suggestion that may be or may not be helpful. Uh, I just wanted to agree with Mr. Scott about bringing back the evening service. I work in those arts. I work for the School of the Arts. And a lot of our work happens in the evenings and in places where, like, for instance, 104 is 
the closest one that goes to our campus. And sometimes we will have a show that ends at 10 o'clock at night. Oh no, how are we going to get home? Maybe somebody will give us a ride at least downtown where we could catch 106, but that would win some running either. Um, and so I think it would be very useful just to bring those back because there are a lot of people that are working that late, even if it doesn't seem like they're very visible. Uh, maybe in line with that same comment, if there is a way that we could get some more outreach to students on those campuses to increase ridership that way. I know a lot of our school of the arts students don't have cars and are kind of reliant on whatever transportation they have to go to and fro. But if there's a way that someone could reach out to these colleges and like the um, gentleman that works at Forsyth Tech, if there's a way that people could reach out to these colleges and say, hey, let us give you some information that you can share with your students about what the transit authority looks like and how they can use it in their everyday lives as they're here in town. That might be a, a helpful way to increase ridership and make it more available on hours where it may not be so that once that comes back, it's worth everyone's time. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you need to say something? Yeah, no, you can go ahead and say something. <laughs> this is my mom, by the way. She is Carolyn Wright. She works at the School of the Arts with me. She also has been riding bus all her life too. I'm not sure what she's gonna say, so let's see. <laughs> Again, I am Carol Wright. I also work for North Carolina School of Arts. As my daughter stated before, it's very hard for us to get home if we work in a show and it doesn't get out to mm -hmm. 10 o'clock or 10 30. All right, we are on 106 route and we have to either get 91 and walk from Trade and Northwest Boardwalk all the way over to Townview. I live in Townview mm -hmm. Apartments. And Townview Apartments is by um, Clark and 14th Street. Okay. So that's a long walk. It's dark on Northwest Boulevard. A lot of the homeless mm -hmm. population hangs out there. And it's dark. A lot of times the light's not on. You have to walk around there. I have to go up a hill to get home. Mm -hmm. If I don't catch that bus, I can get 89. But I still have to get off at... Um, 14th and University, I have to walk up a hill, walk up another hill, then walk down the hill to get to my home. Well, you never know, it's a big tree right there at that bus stop on University and 14th Street. You never know who's behind that tree. It's not safe. Walking either direction is not safe because somebody could jump out and grab you or hurt you. You don't know the day all these things that are happening. You don't know if you're safe or not. Right. I walk and pull up a hill. And I'm 76 years old for one thing. And I've always been able to walk. I don't mm -hmm. want trans aid. I want to ride the bus. If I get to that point where I need trans aid, then maybe I consider it. But for right now, I like to ride the bus. Okay. And I also now have a little health problems. I have a collapse of lung. So it's hard for me to pull up a hill without stopping about mm -hmm six or seven times before I get home right. because, you know, I, I just can't walk like I normally do. But I try to do the best that I can do. But it would be very helpful if you bring back 106 and also if you bring back 104 because those are the two buses that really affect us the most. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Did it, Patrick, did you want to speak to that or? No, I, I was just, if you guys see me on the screen, I'm facing down, it's because I'm writing post-it notes about everything everyone's saying. So um, I was just taking notes for, um, I think it was um, Miss Wright and her mother there. I think it was Latanya and Carolyn, just yes. hearing about the needs to get to NCSA um, with events that end at 10 p.m., the, the need and benefit of outreach to college students. Maybe we could have that forwarded to Tina um, after this meeting. And then um, I just hear a little bit more about how that walk up the hill to 91 and 106 is, is a challenge. And uh, it's one. Northwest, excuse me. Yeah, thank you. Um, great. It's great to have three different people telling us parts of that story because when you have three people telling you a version of the same thing based on where they live, you 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 can guess that it's probably a problem for a lot more people than the three people who've illuminated it for us this evening. So that's all great insight and we appreciate it. Okay, we have a few more. So hang on. Uh, she, sorry, she had her hands first. I'll get you. If you'd state your name. Um, yes, my name is T.T. Harmon. I work with Housing Authority here in Wilson Sunday. So a lot of our residents yes. ride um, in the same transit authority. And we enjoy it. Okay. So the family back here, I work for Housing Authority. 
I don't have a magic wand, <laughs> but call down to the more and speak to Miss T. We're gonna help bring out y'all some other type of transportation and get y'all home in the evenings where that won't be a barrier at all. Um, secondly, I think the other issue that we have a wisdom is your bus stops are too far apart. It's not the yes. street, but they are extremely <laughs> Too far apart. I'm fortunate now to be able to drive, but I was one of the faithful riders who got on bus number one on Carver School Road. It took you, you ain't have to get off the bus, it took you straight downtown, straight to the mall, and then you need to get on that six o'clock bus to come on back home for the street light house, right? But that's not there. Mm -hmm. I know more. It's like you catch a bus on this end by Maisie Woodruff, you catch one in the middle by Butterfield, and then you catch it on the other end of Carver School Road where people were actually being able to come up out of these. And this is what y'all don't take consideration. These are larger communities. These aren't somewhere that has one side street, two side street. These are actual communities where people are able to come out the back of the community to walk to the main street to be able to catch the bus. But now I'm at the main street. I got to still go three blocks down the street to catch the bus. So bringing up, and I know we don't have a lot of staff. I know everybody's not in the same category. not a lot of bus drivers. But try to get them a little closer together, some kind of way where it ain't one here and one here and then just one in the middle. And we on a four mile street. Okay. You know, so yes. take that in consideration as well. We can tell. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you very much. <laughs> All right. And did you want to speak? Oh, yeah. yes. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Lisa Shavers. I'm an officer with Local 248 here in Winston, and I'm also a Winston Salem Transit Authority bus driver. Um, I did do, thank you. <laughs> I did do a survey. I um, also talked to Ms. Carroll about it um, when the surveys were coming out. But one of the things I saw was the issue is that Route 93. There's way too much time on it. So what I had put in on the survey was 93 should run like 110 was running. It runs like every 30 minutes. Because you can, as a driver, I was on 93 almost a year. I can run that route in 25 minutes. And that's at the speed limit. Picking up, dropping off wheelchairs, whatever. I can run that route in 25 minutes. So if you, once you pull off from the TC and you got to sit there on DSS, now you have passengers who are angry because you have to sit there so that you meet each time point along the way. So they're fussing at you, but there's nothing you can do because this is what you are supposed to do. Sit there and wait at least till 17 after. You, when you pull off from downtown at the top of the hour, you at DSS by five minutes after. It's not, it's, that's how quick the route goes. So that was one of my suggestions to run it every 30 minutes. Once you come back in, load up, take, take off. It's a simple fix to me instead of sitting there and making passengers angry because you have to sit when you take off you got to sit at ladera crest you go around the corner hit the time point 25 you got to sit there because if you don't now you're going to run anywhere from eight to ten minutes ahead of schedule okay and the other thing was the 108 that was one of my routes as well i really hope that they do not cancel that route because in that area out there those people are going to have to walk a mile or better in order to get to Sprague Street yep. to catch a bus. Right. And it's got to be time because once that bus takes off, if you miss that bus, now you got to wait another yeah, hour. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm telling you, out there on Willow Road, and I didn't like it when I first got it because it's scary out there for one thing. But it's a long stretch from picking up at Marty and T and going out to Willow Road all the way out in that area. Those people are going to be lost without that transportation. So um, that's the comment that I want to make. But everybody, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Chavis. I really appreciate that. Um, Does anyone else have any more comments? We have one more. And again, if you want to state your name. Hey, uh, Hannah Ainsworth. Um, so my question was, is there a plan for how to elicit 
uh, feedback from folks that are going to be directly affected by these route changes. Like I know there are the comment cards and I know that there's advertisements on how to contact, but honestly, I ride the bus a couple times a week. If someone else told me about this event, like it, I mean, it just kind of flew past me. So is there a way to get targeted feedback to make sure that the folks affected are going to be able to have a say? Yes. And I, I think I would turn to Karen and Crystal and Sarah to talk about some of the things that are underway right now and to see if there are other things that um, the I think it was Ms. Hanno might think would be helpful. So um, Karen, and Crystal, mm -hmm. Sarah, can you talk about some of what's been done so far? Yes, I mean, this is our first public meeting for this. So, I mean, it's very intentional that we did do the comment card. And so that's a very good way to get feedback or email us. We will respond to you. So if there's something very specific, um, I mean, that's the best way right now for us to do it. So we're gonna take all this information and then we'll report back to everybody. Well, what, what we included in the study, what we couldn't include in the study and how we can just try to make the best uh, proposed recommendations with everybody's comments you know, taken into consideration. So really, if you have a comment, it's the best either to talk to us after we're gonna be around you can talk to us one-on-one, -on -one, or if you get it in writing, that's really helpful. I, I guess my question was, is that I'm the route that I take isn't directly effective, and I'm wondering about how the folks that are, mm -hmm. yeah. how are they going to be able to submit the feedback? Because I was able to come tonight, but right. I know a lot of folks are unable to. Right. Our, our comment... Our comment period is till May 10th. Yes, the comment period is until May 10th for these uh, recommendations. But I just wanted to make sure that you were aware of the um, the ways that we communicated the meeting tonight and the public uh, meeting, the public comment period, which was April 10th through May 10th. Um, so we did have that. We have it on the buses. It's posted at the transportation centers. Uh, we have had it on the radio stations, um, the uh, Spanish as well as the English radio stations. Um, with Facebook, uh, my uh, marketing director, Ms. Tina Carson and Wilkins, has put it on all of the social media platforms. Um, so we have the comment cards, and we have the, serve, the uh, comment cards at the transportation center, and uh, even on some of the drive the buses as well. So we try to diligently put the information out there because, again, we're having this meeting, we're having these ways, this uh, ways for you to contact because we want to know mm -hmm. what you need and what we can do to address those needs and this um, all of those different forms um, of communication will continue throughout any of the process of this route study and any changes we potentially will be making but we will definitely reach out to all of anyone that has comments to return that information so so the information is on the buses that are being affected yes it should be on all yes. the buses yeah yes and just to, to speak to what Donna is saying what I just took a look um, so Tina Carson Wilkes who is with WISTA has been um, gathering all the comments that have been received and sending them to the team once a week. And uh, her last distribution was on April 21st, four days ago. And at that point, we had already received 39 comments from people about Route 108. So um, in, in Route 108 is the, the leading comment topic right now by a long margin. And so I'm, I'm thinking that there are people who are directly affected that we haven't had a chance to cross-reference all the addresses where people shared them yet. But my sense is that... Um, Definitely on 108, people who um, are hearing about this are letting us know. Um, we hope that as many people more who want to tell us what is important will continue to do so. Um, and I, I would just say um, to Hannah, encourage people um, who are on the bus with you to share, um, you know, their common cards to to write in as they can. Um, but we are definitely seeing people write in, but whether it's on social media, whether it's by email, um, we we have been getting a good amount of um, material in, and we'll, we'll assemble that and make that available so the public and the, the council can see that too. Okay. Oh, oh, he had asked. I'll defer okay. to you. Okay, Philip Summers, I live in Town, 2422 Peachtree Street. So it's in the south side, and 108 is the south side circulator. And I, I did want to add that 108, um, I think is important, particularly because of the low income housing that it serves. And we're having a lot of like housing pressure on the south side. I mean, everywhere in Winston, prices are going up. And whenever you have prices going up, you have people driven out. So there's gonna be more people living on that route. So my comment is more, can we look ahead to the fact there's gonna be even more demand out there? I get it. 
I drove that route. I get it that it's not like the busiest route, but it's probably trending positive. And in light of like, you know, just to be frank, trailer parks that are out there, the low income housing, there's going to be more transit dependent people out there. So it just seems like you wouldn't want to cut that one now because the demand's going to come. I mean, I think you want to be adding and adding and adding because there's there's latent demand that because the buses only come once an hour, you're not tapping the demand that could be there if the service was better. If the service on all the routes is every 30 minutes, you'd have more ridership because right. it would be better service. But Philip, um, if I could if I could add, um, ask you, are there when you think about the folks who are using 108 that you know? Do you have a sense of which destinations are most important to them? Is it a grocery store along the 108 itself? Is it employment on other routes throughout the city? Is it a mix of those? Um, well, it's, it's totally a mix. What it becomes is the extent of your service, right? It's very far south. It's what's penetrating you this far south. And so, you know, the reality is there's a lot of Hispanics down there who are not driving legally. You know, they're driving cars. They're solving their problems. But we want to provide service that's better so that people can take what's safe. Sure. So the, the, it's all of the above, but it, it is the southern extent of your service. So they're really getting it from there to come to Five Star International Market, what's it called now? Or it's not even there anymore, but that whole shopping center. And then if they're linked into the city, right? So it, it has two transfer points. Okay. No, that's helpful. Okay, and Dan Bessie, hang on, I'm getting my steps in. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Dan Bessie. Um, uh, I've been riding uh, the, the bus transit uh, uh, off and on for uh, a number of years. I uh, just moved to a new neighborhood, South Fork is on Route 95. Route 95 is the only uh, uh, service that, uh, uh, that serves that uh, whole street. You know, country club uh, and the neighborhoods along it, including the South Fork neighborhood. Um, if I didn't have another way to uh, get downtown, I wouldn't be here this evening because it's uh, it's, it's daytime only service. Uh, so I know that the point's been made. I just wanted to support it. Uh, the the importance of reinstating the evening hour uh, service as, as soon as we possibly can. And please take a look at the four permanent routes. Well, three of the four, one's dedicated just to a, uh, a business park and it's very limited service. But please look at the three routes that uh, uh, have a permanent service, but have never had evening service. Uh, that includes 95, um, 98, and um, uh, I'm sorry, one other, um, adding that uh, when, when that's feasible. Um, uh, and I think the second point, I think that the uh, the point that Phil and others have made about the value of 108, the circulator, uh, since it's service territory that is not otherwise served, is difficult to, to overstate. Um, and do not discount areas that may have a higher percentage of people who do have another way to go, because they also have a percentage of people who don't have another way. Uh, and they have destination possibilities for employment uh, that can be used by people who live in other areas, but only if that route continues. So thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you for all the good work you did. Thank you, Dan. There you go. Thank you. I appreciate those comments. And I, I think um, to the point you were making about even if there is car ownership, um, one of the most common types of households that is you know, find transit of vital use is a couple that one, this one car between two workers. And so one person is using the car each day and one person is using the bus each day. And every day that family unit is making a decision on who's driving and who's busing to optimize, you know, whatever they're trying to accomplish in life. So you're absolutely right. And we take that seriously. Thank you. Thank you. We have another comment. Yeah. State your name again because we're recording. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, I've got a question about like what actually is the protocol as far as what constitutes a bus stop? Because I know there used to be the blue signs, and those were removed for the green signs, and then it was like we don't stop at certain places anymore. 
Um, so it's, it, but then sometimes some bus drivers do. So then it's kind of hard to determine what constitutes a bus stop. I take the um, 90. So when it comes down Thurman and it crosses Northwest Boulevard, um, there's no, according to one bus, bus driver that wouldn't stop. Basically that stop there on Northwest and um, Thurman, the next stop isn't until you get to Sixth Street. That's a that's a pretty long way. Now there are some bus drivers that stop right there where I think um, it turns into Renolda with Thurman and Renolda split. Um, but that's a pretty long strip without there being a bus stop at all. Some bus drivers stop there, some don't. So what actually constitutes a bus stop? And if that's not a bus stop, can there be a bus stop there? Because that's a pretty long area with no stop. And so that was Route 90. And where is the preferred location? Is it Thurmond and Northwest or is it? Right. When you, when you come down, when you come down Thurmond and you go over to Overpass right there, on the, that's from what I've been told, that's the last stop right there when you're at Thurman and Northwest. Gotcha. And then, then it'll go continue up that way and it'll make the turn on the sixth street. And then there, what I've been told is that that next stop technically isn't until you get all the way down to sixth street. Um, but that, that's a pretty big strip, but then there are bus drivers that stop at that area, um, right where it's like, where I'm not sure what street that is, but it's where, um, it splits into Renolda where, where broad, str uh, yeah. splits in the third broad, broad street. Is it broad street and seventh street there? It's, it's like the, it's like seventh street. Yes. Now there will be some bus drivers that stop there, but then some bus drivers won't and they'll carry you all the way down down Thurman into Broad until it turns down 6th Street and you get off over there by 6th. I'm going to have to um, speak to that. Here yeah, Donna, I would <laughs> let her speak to protocol. Okay, that's fine. So <clears throat> to answer your first question, what constitutes a bus stop? Um, before, there were blue signs. And as, as riders, I'm sure you were able to see the blue signs started fading and they were here and there. And so we transitioned to the green signs. Uh, we did have a campaign where we did publicly advertise that we were going to green signs only. And that was that happened because of safety re reasons. Um, prior to that, we had what we called, it used to be a criteria. So the criteria would consist of a bus stop being a blue stop or at the intersection, or if you made a left turn, as soon as you made the left turn, the first right, it was so many different things that were unpredictable and unsafe. So we, as I stated earlier, we're trying to make sure that things are safe and customer service. So that's why we had the campaign and reached out to anyone that were gonna be affected that usually um, got dropped off or picked up at what was the criteria. So we wanted to hear from you all. If you are doing that, it's gonna go away. Call us, let us know if, how that's gonna affect you. Give us an idea or an, a recommendation. So we actually, I believe Mr. Crawford, if I'm correct me if I'm wrong, we installed uh, about 108 bus stops to our system prior to going green, to the green stops only. So we added that amount of bus stops to our system to make sure that we did not increase the walls and we put them in locations potentially that were safer for the drivers to stop. So if there is a long stretch and I, uh, my operation staff is more familiar with that, which you're talking about directly on Route 90, then we can look at, into um, if we need to add a bus stop to make that, let that walk less. So that's not something that can't happen, but it's a process because we have to go out and look at the area to make sure that it's safe and investigate that before we actually put a stop in place. But that's something that we will take back from the, the notes tonight. <clears throat> I appreciate that comment and, and I appreciate the discussion from Donna too. Um, I just want to do a quick time check. I know that Matt and Karen, you guys had talked about the library does close at eight. And I don't know if there's a point by which we have to do like the last question, but um, anyway, we can do as many questions up to that time, whatever it is. I just wanted to check to see if we knew, know when we have to stop doing questions. Okay. Patrick, if I may, just because we did have some follow-up that I would like to um, give opportunity to some of the uh, passengers in here to get contact information. If I could, we could ask for any, the question period to stop at 745, mm -hmm. that would give us about 10 minutes to interact with anyone individually yes. to get contact information so that we can follow up and then we can be out of the library um, at 5, 8 o'clock. Okay, <laughs> great. And did you have 
One, one more, Patrick, here. I think we have time for one or two more. Yes. Then. Just, yeah. just coming behind what my man just said, uh, most recently, my most recent complaint that I filed on two of your drivers, I was standing at the bus stop, me and another patron, uh, last Friday, and your, both the operators on the 95 and the 81 drove right by. So my statement to you again, just hire us better bus drivers, ones that's willing to do the job. So if the green sign is the bus stop, and we're standing at the bus stop. Why are they going by? That's a problem. So it's something y'all need to take care of. Yes, sir. Thank you. Does anybody have any more comment? We have about five minutes. No. Okay, hold on. Yep. Um, I want to say something positive for transit. I think it's a real investment in the community and to the extent that we can just spend more on transit. Mm -hmm. I think we could make it a more attractive place to work. They have a really hard time retaining drivers. It's a really hard work environment. I, I worked there for a year. I think investing in transit has real potential to lift our poor people out of poverty. So instead of always just like externalizing the cost and rationalizing the cost, I would really like us to take a hard look and just investing more dollars into our local community and public transit. Good comment. Thank you. Thank you for that. Anybody else? Okay, Jeff, did you want to say anything or Donna to wrap it up? Oh, but you didn't sign in. Just make okay. sure. Oh, one thing, if you did not sign in, would you please, there's a registration table out front, if you don't mind on your way out signing in. So we just want to make sure we have everybody's information and um, we'll do some closing comments. Okay, again, um, as the general manager for Winston Salem Transit Authority, I really appreciate the response tonight. Um, this really goes a long way. It lets us know as a staff that we have some work to do. Um, we can do things that right now um, that do not have an additional cost associated because funding is also an, uh, an issue. And that's one of the reasons why we took the opportunity to make some changes with the routes that would not have an impact on our funding because we don't have the funding that's needed to increase service. Long-term, we would love to have 30-minute service or even more frequent service on the heavier ridership routes because we know the more frequency we have, the more ridership. That is known, a known fact. So we know what we need to get to, but we have to get there in increments when we have the, we have the resources to do so. But to help us do that and help us give you what you want, we definitely need to hear from you. And if that's the comment cards tonight, if that's coming through an email, a phone call, just make your voice heard. We hear you, we're gonna document it. The team, we're gonna to work together and we're gonna make sure that we can get to that, that point one day that we have this service that the citizens of winston tell me. But again, I just wanna thank you all for coming out. And I do have my staff here. We're here to hear from you. If you wanna to talk to us one-on-one, -on -one, give us your contact information, but please, by all means, fill out the comment cards and turn them in to Tina out there at the, the desk so that we can respond to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Donna. And I'll open last few comments. Uh, both of I'd like to say, Commissioner Besson, I appreciate your attendance and thank you for your uh, continued support of public transportation. I recognize that. I also publicly thank Ms. Donna Woodson for a uh, pretty thankless and impossible job. So she does a great <laughs> job. I recognize her publicly for that and her team. So. Thank you for that. It's a hard job, as you heard tonight. Yeah, yeah close your uh, As you heard tonight, right, there's, there's no perfect solution, but there is a better solution, and that's why we're here. And I will say this one other time, too, our, to our drivers that are in attendance, thank you. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for the challenges that you take on head on every day. Public Bell, thank you as well. And if you hadn't heard one thing tonight, we are hiring. <laughs> so I understand that. No. From the city's perspective, we have a job to do. You've heard that recurring tonight, and we're going to do our job. It's not going to come as just easy as it would like to be. But what I will say is that the input we take tonight uh, matters. Uh -huh. and, and if I say anything to you tonight, I understand the input we have tonight matters. And so fill the cards. Tell your, tell your friends, the people that you ride the bus with, so we know what changes are going to be the most effective. Not what we are recommending, but what are the most effective by the user. So understand that. Thank you for your time. And again, thank you for all the hard work. And Patrick, for you and your team, all the work to, to get put this together as well. I'll thank you as well. So we'll stick around as long as we need till they kick us out. But again, <laughs> thank you for your time. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.
I'm going to sign off. Thank you, everyone. That was fantastic.